So you want to fight against cultural Marxism. It is great that so many people want to stop the trend of cultural Marxism that is happening in America and in churches today, but we are not ready to fight the battle. Not until people know what socialism is and what is wrong with it. And you don't really know until you know the alternative, which is laissez-faire capitalism, also called free market capitalism. I'm Cody Leibold. I'll be talking with Jacob Brunton today, and you can find us at christianintellectual.com. So I recently attended Stand Against Marxism, the conference in Iowa, and all 14 excellent speakers presented about the agenda of the Marxists and about how they're infiltrating society and the church. But only one or two of the speakers talked about Marxism in terms of its fundamentals, explaining it as uh, the competitor to capitalism, trying to destroy capitalism. Karl Marx named his book Das Kapital, and he popularized this term capitalism to stand for the system that he was trying to overturn. And so that is the term capitalism that we are defending. In our last video, we presented a rational and a theological case for the principles on which laissez-faire capitalism rests, namely justice, personal interest, productivity, individual profit seeking. And we showed why the standard of justice is cause and effect. Justice means people receive what they have earned. And we opposed that standard to that of the leftists. So that would include John Rawls, Timothy Keller, anyone who tries to rename charity justice. We cannot call charity justice, or else we're going to end up making a moral monster out of the God described in the Bible. He's a God who does not owe anyone anything, even if they need it. He's a God who says, I will have mercy on who I have mercy. And he is a God who chooses to help people for the sake of his own glory, his own pleasure, never in virtue of their need. For these reasons, Christians must distinguish charity from justice, and we must follow the biblical model of each individual seeking that which is in his own personal interest. For what does it profit a man is the capitalistic language of the Bible. God is a capitalist, Jesus is a capitalist, not in terms of wanting to trade human goods and services, but in terms of wanting what is best and seeking it and upholding justice in all cases. So do you want to fight against social justice, against this cultural Marxism? Well, let's start there. Jacob, talk to me about what, what is happening in the church today with social justice. Why is this such a big problem? Well, there's a big move uh, about social justice in the church today, and a lot of it is predicated, as you said, on a theory of justice, which sounds very compassionate. It sounds very Christian because it's concerned primarily with helping those who are in need. The problem is that that's not the Christian view of justice. And here's where people get confused. It's, it is very Christian. It is very good to be concerned with helping those who are in need. The problem is in calling that justice. Because as we talked about in the last video, and as you'll see if you peruse our articles on the topic at christianintellectual.com, this perverts the idea of biblical justice, and it turns the justice of God and the gospel on its head, and it makes God out to be a moral monster. It makes the, the, the gospel irrelevant. It makes the cross irrelevant. It makes Christ's work irrelevant. And so this is really a problem with using the wrong terms, but it's not just semantics. It's not just terminology. The, the terms are rooted in a whole different ideology. You see, many people believe that because helping those in need is a good thing, therefore it's owed to those people. And that's what is contained in that idea of justice. Justice is about what you owe to someone else or what you deserve from someone else. And that's what the problem is. The problem is not just calling it justice. The problem is in the idea that it is owed to somebody just because they need it or that it is deserved from somebody just because you need it. And that's what we really want to, we want to battle against. But this is going on all over in the culture, right? You, you look at Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Elizabeth Warren, it, everybody, and many people on the right as well, are sympathetic at least to the idea that a need constitutes some sort of right. That whenever you see 
people hurting or in need, whether it's because they lost their job or because uh, maybe they don't see someone in need. Maybe they just see inequality, right? That, that's, a, that's a big topic today where you talk about how the rich are getting richer. The question is, well, who cares? Well, if you have this idea of justice in mind, then you care a lot because justice means getting what you need uh, because you need it. And the extent to which someone is getting richer, well, then they, they owe more to you because you don't have as much as them. And, and you need three square meals or you need a car or you need a boat. And, and who's to stop you from saying that you need a boat or you need an airplane, you need a private jet uh, if all you have is your feelings to go off of. And, and that's really what this is. It's, it's all very subjective. It's all based in comparing yourselves to other people in a very covetous and collectivistic type of mindset. They call it oppression that they're fighting, but oppression is any outcome which is not equal. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really stretching that term beyond what it means because then you know, anybody that lived by the standards of the 1950s would be considered oppressed today because we have so much more wealth today. And, but so there, there, it's not an objective standard, it's, it's a comparative. It's you're, you are oppressed if other people have something you don't. And that, that is covetousness. The 10th commandment turned into an ideology and a, and a political philosophy. And with this comes an antipathy to capitalism, individualism, individual rights. Anybody that wants to just seek his own personal interest on the earth. And, and so, who is going to stand up and say, that's wrong, and here's the alternative? Today, our topics are, what is capitalism? And is that what we have right now? This is something that a lot of people are confused about. They would say, oh, well, we're not Soviet Russia, so we are the capitalist nation. No, we are not the capitalist nation. We have not been for a very long time, 100 years, we've not been a capitalist nation. So what do we have now? You know, what is the alternative to capitalism? If we had capitalism, how would it work? And, and how do we defend the idea of capitalism against some of the most common objections that even the really thoughtful people have brought to us? Where would you like to go next? I, I would like to touch real quickly on the idea of oppression because okay. that, and that ties in with the idea of inequality. When, when people talk about oppression in terms of inequality, of you know, some people have more than me and therefore I'm being oppressed, or just referring to the free market as oppressive because uh, certain people can't make what they want to make in the free market. They, they can't obtain what they want to obtain in the free market and therefore it's oppressive. What, what they mean is that reality is oppressive. Because if you think about it, if, if you took away those other people, so, so say, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of these people who says, I'm being oppressed because Cody has more wealth than me. And, and I've just, I've fallen on hard times and I, I can't get by. I'm, I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I, I'm going into debt, whatever the case is. And, and I'm being oppressed unless, unless Cody gives me or unless the government steals from Cody uh, to subsidize my needs. What, what I mean is that reality is really oppressing me because if you think about it, if Cody goes away, if Cody goes to another country or if Cody died, right? If, if no one else on earth existed, I would still have the same needs that I have. I, you're not, see, the, the problem is people think that you're born with all kinds of wealth and society takes it away from you. Rich people take it away from you. As they get rich, they're taking from you what you were born with. But the truth is, no, you were born with nothing. And that's just plain reality. If you were born in the middle of a desert island and your parents died, you wouldn't have any society to steal wealth from. Are you being oppressed? No. You, re reality is what you think is oppressing you. you really, what, when you say that you're being oppressed, because you don't have what you want what you're saying is that you're at war with reality and that's not a good position to be in so what we're advocating for here is a complete shift of mind where you say 
I'm not going to be at war with reality. I'm going to accept the fact that I come into the world deserving nothing. That anything I want, I have to work to earn it. And if I fail, that's on me. And it's my responsibility to provide for myself, for my family, or for whoever it is that I value and care for. It's my responsibility, no one else's. And if anybody else decides not to help me in whatever way, whether that means they decide not to hire me, whether that means they decide to pay me a lower wage than I think I'm worth, whether that means they decide not to give me a handout when I ask for it, whatever the case is, they are not oppressing me because I didn't deserve that to begin with. I had no claim to those things to begin with. Because I am viewing reality as it is, meaning that I only deserve that which I have created and earned myself. So our presentation today is all on the topic of economics, and you just reminded me of something you said in our last video, which is the most basic principle of economics is where does wealth come from? It's, it's produced. It's produced. It's not there. Uh, poverty is the natural state of things until yes. someone comes and works. And so production, production. And then the question is, if somebody comes up to you and they say, I'm being oppressed because I need more things and I need somebody to give those to me. Typically, when people speak of social justice, they are talking about the government intervening. Let's talk about what, what is the government? The government is force. That's the special thing that the government does. And the reason why we have a government and not 17 of them is because it's dangerous to have a whole bunch of people entitled to use force. So we put it under objective control. And uh, that is how we assure that each person is treated equally. That's why we have a system of laws that says, well, what are the wrongs that are so serious that we call them a crime? And when you appeal to the government and you say, I have been wronged, I have been oppressed, and I want you to fix the problem, you're appealing to the bearer of the sword, or in this case, the gun. And you're saying, this organization has to take money from someone else, or it has to prohibit someone from doing something, or it has to do something for me. That's what, that's what you're asking for. Now, that is, not the, that is not a rational conception of what a government is. It's not the conception of what a government is that we find in the Bible. If you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2 or Romans 13, or if you turn to Exodus chapter 18, when you see the passages in the Bible that, you know, these are not, these are not a, like a textbook on how to form a government, but when you see the passages that talk about what the government is supposed to do, it is supposed to bear the sword against wrongdoers. You don't see passages in the Bible where somebody says, let's appeal to the government to take half of our money and then to, to build something great, except for in a few places. Solomon, which, you know, he used forced labor, he conscripted people, and this was considered oppressive, and it led to the, the uh, collapse of their nation. Uh, or, or when the people came up to Samuel and they said, give us a king. And the difference between a judge and a king is exactly the difference between what you and I are describing right now. Uh, the judges, is, the, their role is to say someone committed a crime and will define it objectively in a way that everybody can understand, and here's the punishment for that crime. Whereas a king... Samuel warned, is going to take your sons and daughters. He's going to take your best possessions. And that's displeasing to God that th they would have that because the government that God gave them was the government under the judges, starting with Moses. So that just let me share with you just a bit from Exodus 18. Uh, so Moses, right, right as soon as they were out of Egypt, he began to judge the people. That is when somebody had a conflict, when somebody had a claim against somebody else, they needed a judge who could arbitrate. And he was doing it all himself. And then Jethro said, no, that's not okay. So you're going to need to appoint sub-judges. And that's how they formed a government. And the purpose of that government was to judge. It's a whole different purpose than we see from someone like Marco Rubio today. Like Marco Rubio says, the government's job is to provide us a, a good vision and, and to make the world more fair and these different kinds of things that he says and to, to protect families and to encourage families to to grow, you know, and he's subsidizing families. That's part of his tax structure. We don't see any of that in the Bible. That's, that's not the way it was. And, and the reason for that is because when you begin to subsidize something and when you give that kind of power to the government, the government never shrinks after that. 
You're giving the government the ability to give people favors. You've just turned the government into a favor collector. And you've just incentivized the entire populace to go to that government and to tell it, I'm the one that needs the favor. And you've incentivized bribery and all kinds of things. And so, so that's the problem is you've just, you just removed the rule of law. Now it's the rule of men, whoever, who, whoever has the most pull. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it creates class warfare and, and breaks people up into pressure groups. And that's what we see today, the, the, the introduction of certain regulations or, or any intrusive regulation from the government uh, incentivizes people to try to gain pull with the government, either through lobbying or through special relationships or some, whatever pull mechanism it is, sometimes bribery, uh, in order to get the regulations that are going to benefit you or that are going to hurt your competitors, whether it's in the realm of business or in the realm of culture, right? We see that with, with the culture wars today, uh, trying to get XYZ legalized or XYZ enforced by the law uh, and punishing people who disagree with you. It's, it's a never ending struggle of class warfare once you go down that road. And the solution is to have an objective standard that says that the government is strictly there to protect against the initiation of force. Let's talk and, about that. In, in, initiation yeah. of force, or, or more broadly, treat people equally under the law and protect their individual rights. But you go to initiation of force because that's the core. Can you explain that? Well, so the only way to violate someone's rights is by initiating force against them. And, you know, one, one common objection, and I think we probably want to get into the objections here. So one, one common objection is, well, but then people are going to do immoral things. Then, then there are going to be things that are immoral or sinful, which will be legal. And, and, and that'll be bad. And my answer is, who says that the government is supposed to outlaw all sin? It, and more importantly, don't you realize that it might be a sin to outlaw certain sins? Don't you realize that it might be a sin to initiate force against someone? Would it be a sin for me to hold a gun to someone's head and say, be a Christian? Or, or do you not think that it's sinful not to be a Christian? Are you picking and choosing what you think is a serious sin and what is not? Do you think that homosexuality is a more serious sin than atheism do you think it's not as sinful to be a mormon as it is to take drugs see i i think the mindset that when when you have in your head that okay the government has to punish all sin and then you start being selective about the sins that it's going to punish you say well no i, I don't want it to punish this belief that, that that's too radical that's too extreme well, then you're admitting that you don't actually see disbelief as a sin. But you do see these other things as sinful. And, and, and so you're admitting that you don't actually have a Christian view of what sin is. If you're going to have a consistent Christian view of sin, you have to have a either full-on theonomy, a theocratic authoritarian government, which most people today probably don't really want if they're going to be honest, or you have to understand that it's a sin to initiate force. And that means it's a sin to pass certain laws against certain actions. And the flip side of that is it's not the government's job to regulate morality in that way. Anyways, that's our job as Christians. We're supposed to be salt and light. We shouldn't be farming our responsibilities out to the government. And I think this is part of the reason why many Christians, many conservatives have become morally complacent. And while we've lost a lot of our moral authority, because instead of doing the hard work of convincing people of the, the superior value of our morality, we rely on the government to just outlaw those things that we think are immoral. And, and, and we think, well, there, now, now we've produced a moral society because the things that we don't like are not legal anymore. And that's how we're going to produce a moral society. But that's not true morality. The way to produce a moral society 
is by preaching true morality and by convincing people of it and living it and being an example, being salt and light in the world. That's what the church is supposed to be doing. But the church, unfortunately, has been farming that responsibility out to the government. And we need to stop that. So you've named your principle for what defines what is the proper sphere of the government. It is when force has been initiated, the government responds in retaliatory force. And so just to be totally clear on what we think the purposes of the government are, you, you know, the way the Constitution is set up, it shows us what the government needs to do. There needs to be a body of people that make the laws about, you know, we, we have certain laws and then we need to to have a body of people that judge whether or not somebody has broken those laws and what the penalty should be. And, uh, and so we're going to need a, a judge. We're going to need a police force. And then, uh, of course, in the event that there is an invading nation, we're going to need a leader of our army. So that would be the, the executive branch. We've got the three branches right there. And there's not a lot more than that that a government needs to have on, on our laissez-faire conception of what a government is, but you know, there are competing ideas. And uh, Jacob is, you, you know, you're, you're starting by saying, this is my principle is initiation of force is, is how we define whether the government should do it or not, whether the, the government's job is to step in or not. But other people would say, well, what about the common good? You've heard about that one. Yeah. I want to know who this common person is. <laughs> the, so if, if the common good ever requires the sacrifice of the good of one individual, my question is, is it really the common good? C can the common good be achieved by sacrificing the good of even one individual and much more so several individuals or several thousand individuals? And that, that's not to mention the fact that it's not possible to centrally cl calculate what is the common good, right? Uh, so uh, in, in a sense, I could agree with the common good theory if what we mean is the common good, meaning the good which all humans have in common is to be free of the initiation of force. That, that, that's the one common good that, that everybody has in common. That's the one good that we all have in common and that can be objectively identified. So I'm all for basing government on the common good if that's what we mean. But if you start to go beyond that, then you're going to be sacrificing some people's goods to the goods of others. And then you're treating men like sacrificial animals rather than like images of God. And, and we should tremble at that. And I think too many Christians don't tremble at that the way that they ought to. To spell it out, we don't believe that it is justified that the government be funding education. We don't believe in public roads. We don't believe in public libraries, public health services, public housing, public welfare programs. We don't believe in regulatory agencies that exercise autonomous authority as if they were the lawmakers, but it's really just an agent. You know, the, the laws should be the laws. We don't actually believe they should be, there should be regulations. There should just be laws. Should there be a federal reserve or sales tax, income tax, corporate tax, estate tax, inheritance tax, capital gains tax, tariffs? No. Even if the founding fathers were wrong on that one, on the tariffs one, should there be laws about prices? Should there be laws about minimum wages? Should there be laws about labor unions? None of these things, no government oversight of the economy at all, except to protect against crime and fraud. The government's job is to uphold contracts. So, uh, yeah, and just to explain very briefly, fraud is the same thing as initiating force. And, you know, we can, if anybody has questions about that, just ask us, but it's, it's pretty simple to see why that is. If you lie to somebody, you take their money, you don't deliver the thing. It's like you're camping on their money and you would have to use force to go get it. So it's, it's the equivalent of they initiated force and they took your money out of your house. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is our vision for what the government should be doing under laissez-faire capitalism. That is, we distinguish between positive rights and negative rights. Positive rights would be, I have the right to healthcare. No, you don't. Negative rights means I have the right to keep my money and nobody can come and take it from me. You see, those are incompatible principles. If 
if somebody else has the right to healthcare at my expense, then I don't have the right to my money. And we need to learn how to think in terms of rights, in terms of absolutes. The way people talk about rights today, it's like, well, yeah, you kind of have the right to this. You kind of have the right to that. No, no, you absolutely have the right to that. No one can take it from you. Or you absolutely do not have the right to that if we're talking about something like healthcare or if we're talking about a, a product or service from somebody else. And, yes. and, that's, that, that, and it's, it makes it easier if you think of it in terms of slavery because that, that's what was wrong with slavery. That's what is wrong with slavery is the idea that you have a right to force somebody to give you what they have produced or what they uh, are able to produce with the, their product or their service. And it, it doesn't make a difference that you're doing it to a medical professional rather than to someone who's picking cotton. It's still as evil. And, and I would challenge someone to tell me what the moral difference is between those two examples in any consistent or objective way, because I don't think you can do it. There is no, no morally significant difference. So let's get into, uh, this is a couple of misunderstandings that, that have happened when I've tried to explain this theory to people. One is that people don't understand what force is. So Bill Gates never initiated force on anyone as far as we're aware, even though he sold computers that had some problems, or even, even though his computers were designed so that his competitors' programs wouldn't work very well on them or, or something. I don't even know all the details, but even if he did that, he did not initiate force. And it's pretty debatable whether he committed any kind of fraud. What, why in the world would you be obligated to help your competitors? Yep. That's absurd. That, that, is, that is absolutely absurd. What, if, if somebody came to you, say you're a mechanic, and someone came to you and said, hey, uh, you need to adjust your prices so that the mechanic across the street, who is your competitor, uh, can better compete with you. Or you need to not provide such good service because the mechanic across the street can't keep up and he's losing business. How would you respond? I, I think too often we, we treat people like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or uh, who, who's uh, the head of Amazon? Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, yes. He, he's, he's a modern day Satan uh, among a lot of people. We, we treat those types of guys differently. We, we have a different moral standard for them than we do for the little fella, like an auto mechanic, uh, because we've got a similar mindset to that of Bernie Sanders or AOC, where we are thinking of them as rich people whom we envy, we're covetous of their wealth and their success, and we suspect that the only reason that they were able to get that wealthy is because they cheated the system somehow. They committed some sort of injustice because there's no way to get that wealthy without committing some sort of injustice, without stealing from me in some way. And yet, if you were to bring that down to the level of a pretty successful auto mechanic and a not so successful auto mechanic, people would say, you're stupid. You're just being envious. You're just being covetous. Stop it. Get over it. He did better than you. But too many conservatives don't, make the connection when we're talking about the, the more uh, prosperous people in society. And, and I, I really wonder why that is. So let's move into a couple other topics. There's this one that's been on my mind. Uh, it's just a lot of people today make arguments, but they do not know how economics works. And so, <laughs> so they want to make these arguments about you know, tariffs are going to bring back jobs and jobs are good, right? It's like you've dropped the context. There are, there are other considerations here. Uh, you're hurting some other people. Maybe you're hurting everyone, even though nominally you see a rise in jobs in a certain city or whatever. So I think we should talk about economics. It's not a super complicated topic. It is well understood. And, on, you know, on economic grounds, capitalism is easily defended there aren't any serious competitors to the capitalist theory of economics. 
it's actually the moral competitors that we have to deal with because mm -hmm. like you pointed out in the previous video, if somebody believes that something's wrong, then they're going to fight against it. Um, even, even if apparently capitalism works or something like that, but you, you see a lot of contradictory critiques against capitalism. Like it doesn't really work. And so we shouldn't use it. Well, it does work, but you know, it's like, wait, those don't work together. But since the time of Adam Smith of the wealth of nations that he published in 1776, I believe, uh, there's been this principle called the invisible hand. And it says that when people are left free to trade, to choose what they're going to produce, who they're going to trade with, and how much they're going to charge, that over time, it benefits everyone. The wealth increases greatly all around. And part of the reason why it does this is from the principle of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage just means that uh, given all the options available to you at a specific time, if you do the thing that is going to have the least opportunity cost for you, you're going to get more wealthy. And everybody doing that all at the same time, everybody will become more wealthy. So there's no such thing as saying, hey, in our town, we have this factory and we're not very good at making this. And in that town over there, they're very good at it and they're, they're, they're making too much and they're selling it too cheap. And therefore, let's just make a law that says we cannot trade with that town. If you do that, you will hurt that town and you will hurt your own town. That's what the law of comparative advantage explains is that when people have that freedom, everybody will benefit. Even the people that are worst at making this stuff are going to be better off. So a comparative advantage is an important principle that I, I see overlooked a lot. An another principle of economics that is just well explained in the 20th century by, uh, you know, by guys like Mises, Hayek, and Hazlitt is the role that prices have in communicating value. Prices are a signal of value. And if you control the economy by making it illegal to charge a certain thing or required to charge a certain thing, you're removing from the system the ability of prices to signal value. When you do that, then people make bad investments. Investments that don't pay off as well as the investments they would have made had they had more information. You've covered the information. So th these are just basic principles in economics that I think people need to know about so that you can know that there is something there. Just to give you a lead, if you wanted to look up Hazlitt, for example, economics in one lesson, you know, the law of unintended consequences, that ought to convince you that tariffs are not a good idea. Mm -hmm. Let me, I know we're supposed to be focusing on the practical here and I, I keep on uh, backing up to some of the, the theory or the, the abstract, but I, I think this is a really good point to point out. Uh, what you were just talking about where there's the idea that, well, let me just put it this way. So the, the opposite of the principle of comparative advantage, the idea that when other people are well off, I'm eventually going to be well off because of that. So the, the success and the wealth and the productivity and the, uh, and the uh, progress of other people in other cities and, and maybe even other countries is ultimately to my own benefit. The opposite of that, is the idea that the extent to which other people succeed is the extent to which uh, I'm threatened. And, and that is the assumption that all the socialists have, right? That, that, that's the idea of a zero sum, where the extent to which they prosper, I am going to be hurt. And so we have to level the playing field and, and, and we're competing against each other for a, a, a static amount of wealth. Like there's only a certain amount of wealth out there or there's only a certain amount of manufacturing jobs or whatever the case might be. And you have got this mindset that, well, if, if they get it all, then we're not going to get it. Or if they have, the more they have, the less we're going to have. And that, that's the completely opposite mindset uh, from what the reality is. So you, you've, you've got two possible worldviews here when it comes to wealth. You either have a view of wealth and humanity that says we must always necessarily be at war with each other, warring against scarce resources, and the extent to which one person benefits is the extent to which another person loses. So therefore, there's no possibility. There's a metaphysical impossibility for economic peace among mankind. That's one view. That's a socialist view. I think it's evil. It's dark. It's nihilistic. It's ugly. And then there's the other view, the, the view that embraces 
what you were describing as the principle of comparative advantage. It's the view of capitalism. It's the view of free markets that says the extent to which other people prosper, I will ultimately prosper. And, and in that view, you can be at total peace and harmony with other people economically because you can be excited that other people are prospering. You can be excited that other people are getting lots of wealth because in some way, you know that that's going to come around to your benefit ultimately. And they can be excited for you when you succeed and are wealthy and because they know that in some way that's going to benefit them. And so it's a, there's, a, there's the capitalist view of win-win relationships among men and there's a socialist view of win-lose relationships among men. So I want to ask, do you believe that men can have economic peace? Do you believe that human beings can live together economically in peace and be happy for each other as they succeed? Or do you think that it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and that the, the only way you can succeed is by hurting other people? I think the, the, the better view is obvious. Let's name some of the resources that have been influential on us. Atlas Shrugged has been incredibly helpful for understanding what is wrong with cronyism and what happens in society when pull is the principle by which laws are made. And uh, it also shows us what is the role of the mind in human life. That's the theme of the book. So you've got that. You've also got from Ayn Rand two other really important books for understanding the theory, The Virtue of Selfishness and Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal. And then from uh, someone who has studied Rand, you have Yaron Brook. And two books from him that I would, I would start with, The Free Market Revolution and another one that he co-authored, I think he co-authored both of these, another one called Roosevelt Care. And it answers a lot of the objections that people bring up. For example, well, you know, I believe in capitalism, but don't we need a safety net? And so what is Obamacare? And what is Social Security, aka Roosevelt Care? So let's talk about some of these misunderstandings that people will bring. You know, they will say, we need a safety net. People don't understand what's going on when they say that. You're creating, if you create a safety net, you, you are creating a dislocation in the economy. And if you want to see an obvious example and proof of what's wrong with it, why it is a distortion, why it hurts people, just look at the most prominent case of the safety net that we have in our society today. Look at Obamacare. In this system, people are waiting in line months and months and months for lower quality health care. It's costing them more. They have less options. We have rationing going on. And the overall percentage of the economy that is under the control of the government has increased significantly due to this one piece of legislation. And part of the reason why it's costing so much is because it increases the amount of um, it, the amount of administrative administrative work and oversight from the government. There are just buildings upon buildings upon buildings of offices of people that are making sure that this person gets that and this person gets that because they, according to law, are owed it or they're not. This work is taking over the lives of the doctors. They spend more of their time doing the administrative work now and proving that they're doing what the government wants them to do than just treating patients. And yeah, and the, it's important. Sorry, it's important to point out that what we had before Obamacare wasn't a free market in healthcare. Right. Right. So don't don't think that what we're saying is, oh, well, the good old days before Obamacare, that, that was a that was a capitalist system in healthcare. It absolutely was not. We've had incremental statism in the healthcare industry for a very long time. Obamacare is just a pinnacle of that. Mm -hmm. Since the 70s and 80s, the, the doctors have given themselves to be slaves. They decided to do it. Uh, and you can read, and I think it's one of those two books I already recommended uh, from Rand. There's a chapter by Leonard Peikoff that explains that exact thing that he, he observed in the 80s. So uh, our ideal is the separation of the state and economics for the same reason as you would separate the state from the church. It's because the realm of your personal convictions, your ideas of how you're going to live your life is just not the proper role of the government. It's just not. And when you insert force into what people are allowed to believe or what they're allowed to spend their money on and invest in, then what you're doing is prohibiting people from using their mind. It's a dangerous thing to do because it is from your mind, your main tool of survival, that, that your prosperity comes. You prohibit or 
uh, or inhibit people from using their minds, to the extent that you do that, then you are making us all more poor and less human. I, I wanted to mention, you were mentioning resources earlier. I also wanted to mention Euron Brooks' book, In Defense of Wealth, The Moral Case for Finance. It's, it's a little bit more recent, but he, he goes through the history of quote-unquote usury and laws against it and, and the ways in which uh, interest and finance really help the economy. They help human progress and, and how moral and, and, and good they are. Uh, and I, I I was really surprised by a lot of what he a lot of the information that he had in there. I I really appreciated it. I learned a lot, and I would recommend it to a lot of other people. Uh, do you want to go through some of the other objections that we have here, Cody? Yeah, let me let me find some of these. So here's one: well-functioning markets are a prerequisite for the exercise of everyone's rights. The state must protect the functioning of the marketplace against bad actors who would disrupt it rather than use it. And the government needs to stop people who undermine free exchange of goods and services in whatever industry. It needs to stop people from creating coercive monopolies. Uh, com companies that are big are in the position to use their market position to undermine capitalism, and that violates people's rights. I, I was with that objection. Uh, objection. It, it wasn't an objection until the last sentence. Uh, wh what do you mean by coercive? Right? Coercive means force. If you don't, if you don't have force in mind, if you don't have the initiation of force in mind, then you shouldn't use the word coercive because it's not coercive. If you think it's coercive to uh, be really good in such a way that and have really low prices in such a way that you uh defeat your competitors in the market and you're able to gain a majority share of the market or even a, a full monopoly I, I don't know that that ever really happens uh but uh, at least apart from government regulation um but even if you even if you did who have you committed coercion against who have you initiated force against the answer is no one and, and what you're doing is you're making everybody's lives better off. The, if, if you have a monopoly in a genuinely free market, apart from any government regulations, if you have a monopoly, what that means is you are providing a very valuable service to lots of people for very cheap, which means you're making their lives much better off. And if you ever stop doing that, then you're going to get a competitor. And you're probably going to lose your monopoly. What, what's, what's wrong with that? that I, I challenge anybody to point out what is morally wrong or even economically wrong with a genuine monopoly that is obtained apart from any sort of government regulation. When people speak of coercive monopolies, by definition, there's only one kind of coercive monopoly, and that is the monopoly that's protected by law. If through government regulations mm -hmm. yeah and and you'll notice that a, a lot of the the big business big companies tend to be pro regulation but a lot of times that's because they know that they can afford the regulations they, they can afford to jump through all of the bureaucratic loophole or uh hoops and red tape and they know that their competitors won't be able to afford it and so a lot of times regulations are a way to keep competitors out. Regulations are the things that create actual coercive monopolies. Uh, and they do it in the name of consumer protection or, or whatever the case may be. So what about companies that have a large market share and are capable of doing what I'd call bullying behavior? It's not that they're breaking laws, but they're doing things that make life hard on other people. So for example, Amazon makes it hard on their vendors because Amazon actually competes with some of their vendors. And so if, if the vendors are, you know, the, the vendors are not in a position to bargain against this giant sometimes, because this is the tool, this is the location where we do our business. If Amazon doesn't like us, we're just out. We'll have to, you know, find another job. So I'm, I'm wondering, doesn't that violate people's freedom to do business or doesn't it violate people's uh, freedom to have access to a wide variety of products when, when companies act like bullies. 
I'm assuming by freedom there, the idea is you've got a right to it. And, and my challenge to you is why are you a socialist? Yep. <laughs> and what I mean by that is you're assuming that you have a right to some product or service from other people. You, you have a right for other people to provide certain opportunities for you. And maybe you're not saying I have a right for you to give this money to me. So it's, it's a little less concrete, but what you're saying is I do have a right for you to give me an option or, or a series of options between A and B or between A and C that I can then be free to choose from. You're saying that freedom consists of other people stepping in between you and reality in order to create an artificial uh, choice for you. It, that, that, that's not the way to, that's not freedom. And you don't have a right to that. You don't have a right to a certain wage range. You don't have a right to a job in a certain industry. If, if you had a job in an industry and that industry is dying because there are market changes or new technology or whatever the case may be, you don't have a right to hold on to that. Or if that industry is moving out of your local area, if you grew up in a city where this industry has employed your family for generations, and now this industry is moving to a different state, uh, and, and you don't know what you're going to do, you don't have a right for them to stay in that state just so that you can stay there. You do have a right to move if you want to. You do have a right to change industries. You've got a right to take responsibility for your own life and not expect other people to uh, make you the center of their lives and to make their lives revolve around what you think you have a right to. So what about the worst kind of bullying, which is when those who are already wealthy and already have a business use donating and lobbying to purchase the kind of legislation that is going to keep on benefiting them. That is what we have all over the place in the United States today. Mm -hmm. What do we envision as the solution to that problem? Well, the solution can't be to do more regulations, which require more lobbying and, and more pull peddling like that, right? The, the solution can't be more of what caused the problem to begin with. So that, that's, not, that's, not, that's off the table. That, that's not a solution. Uh, the solution is to get rid of those regulations, get rid of those things that caused those corrupt crony type relationships to begin with. Uh, I agree that cronyism is bad and I don't call it crony capitalism because it doesn't have anything to do with capitalism. It's just plain cronyism or it's crony statism. It's the state and certain businesses. I'm not going to say big business because it's not every big business and it's, it's not as if uh, only big business does it. Small businesses do it too. So it, it's, not, it's not an issue of size. It's an issue of corruption where some businesses like to try to lobby the government in order to get certain regulations passed that'll benefit them or hurt their competitors. And that's corrupt. It's bad. Uh, but I'll also point out that the government has set up things in such a way that you can't succeed without kissing their boots without paying them homage through bribes and uh, lobbying and through all kinds of other things. And so in some ways, it's not entirely the fault of the, the business people that are sort of in bed with the government, although it's hard to tell, right? Once you get the cycle going, it's hard to tell, is the business just doing this to survive? Or are they sort of just paying off the government? They don't, Here, here's the question to ask. Any given businessman who's in bed with the government, who's paying for certain regulations or, or paying politicians through lobbying and things like that, here's the question. Does he prefer a free market? Is it the case that he would prefer not to have to deal with the politicians at all? He would prefer to just compete against his competitors in a completely free market and not have to deal with the politicians at all. If that's the case, then he's, he's moral. And he, he's just doing what he needs to to survive, it, just to an extent. Uh, however, if it's the case that he actually likes this setup, he, he likes that there's regulations, that there's ways for him to pay off politicians in order to cheat the system, then he's a crony. 
and he's evil. Okay, that, that, that's the way to kind of gauge it. And it's hard to tell because, unless you get a chance to actually sit down and talk to one of these guys, which you're probably not going to get to. But the point is, the way to get rid of it is to get rid of the regulations, get rid of the government's ability to pick winners and losers, get rid of the government's ability to have any sort of pull in the marketplace. And then the best business will win. And, and you don't have to worry about these backroom deals. So it'd be wonderful if the current system that has grown up all around of lobbying and of poll and the regulatory state, it'd be wonderful if it didn't exist, if, it, if, if we just had none of it and we just had the system that you and I consider to be ideal. But a couple of questions occur to me. One is, if we did have that ideal system, what processes would be in place to prevent us from sliding back down into cronyism. And another question is, given where we are today in cronyism, what does the process look like to get out of it? In some ways, the answer to both questions is the same. I, I, I think people are right when they say that politics isn't enough, or a free market isn't enough, or uh, the, getting the right government isn't enough, right? The, the, a lot of times people quote some of the founding fathers who talked about how the, the American system was only for a moral people. And apart from a moral people, it's going to corrupt. It's going to go the way that it has. It's going gonna, it's gonna to slide leftward or towards statism and, and corruption. And I think that's true. It, it's, that's going to happen. And in some ways, that, that's the only way to fix it is to start to preach morality to to start to inspire people to be moral but it's important to point out that that's separate from the question of what ought the government to do so th there's morality and people ought to be moral and what we mean by that is people ought to value wealth they ought to value success they ought to value personal responsibility and individual achievement and individual rights. Those are all moral things that we need to reinstill into Americans and into the American culture. We want America to, to rediscover the morality of rational self-interest, the morality of individualism, the morality of success, of, of material and spiritual well-being. We, we want the American culture to rediscover those things. That, that's the moral revolution that we need. And part of that morality implies, particularly on the level of individual rights, that it is immoral to violate individual rights, that it is immoral for the government to initiate force against people. And so th this political question that we're talking about is actually inside of that greater moral question. And the answer to both of those questions is we as the church, as Christians, as men who have been called to lead in the culture to some extent, need to be salt and light. We need to be preaching a positive moral vision. We need to be preaching, uh, we need to be taking the high ground, the moral high ground. And as we do that, one of the implications of that is this political conversation that we're having. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, I have a closing section here for the presentation today. And what I wrote out in preparation for this is that, you know, when, when lawmakers understand that they are able to give special favors to people, then they will become corrupt. That process does corrupt them. The solution is, like you described, it is that we preach morality, that the people of the society no longer wish for special favors because they care more about the rule of law and equality under the law and individual rights. And when they care about those things, even though some people may have biases, did you notice that the founding fathers, each one of them had their own businesses and their own biases? But they thought that the rule of law was important for their own long-term success, for their families and the generations that would come. And they cared about it, even being imperfect people, enough to create a system where the rule of law uh, was in place. And it was the rule of law, not the rule of men. Special favors were, were considered at that time to be inappropriate. Uh, by the mid-1800s, special favors were the main way that politicians got jobs. It, it immediately came in. And it, it, the reason it came in is because people did not fight for the moral prerequisites and foundation for the just society. The yeah. whole society has to believe it. 
Yeah, I, it, this reminds me of that phrase from uh, the passage where uh, Moses and his father-in-law are talking about setting up judges and things like that. And he says, uh, men who hate a bride. I love that language. It, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not men who may not accept a bribe or men who happen to say that they won't accept a bribe. It's men who hate a bribe. That, that's the moral revolution that we need. We, we need to raise up men and women of the culture, especially men though, especially in the church, who despise injustice, who despise a bribe, and who love true justice, who love the idea of people getting what they earn, and they despise the idea of people gaining unjustly through the initiation of force. We need people who have a visceral moral reaction to actual injustice and who have a, an equally visceral moral reaction in a positive sense to true justice and to true prosperity. And, and that's the moral revolution that we need and that we are calling for through FTNCI. There's a saying that you cannot cheat an honest man. And the reason why Americans are being cheated is because Americans have become by and large dishonest in their desires, so whether they have identified it or not, the desire for special favors for your whatever political group is dishonest desire. And you're going to have dishonest politicians as long as you have people asking for that kind of thing. So our political problems are indeed the fruit of our moral problems. And the way we make that better is we advocate for what a moral life should look like what a moral societal life would look like. And we realize that we don't have to establish those conditions in order to be happy. We're not like the Marxists in that way. The Marxists want to create heaven on earth and they're willing to do any amount of murder to get there. We are not willing to do any amount of murder ever. And for that reason, we've already created in our own hearts peace because we understand what justice is. And so we work to advocate that view of what justice is, knowing that it probably isn't going to happen in our lifetime. Knowing that we are going to live in a world that is deeply immoral and in which most people don't even know how deep that is, a world that we do not yet have the power to change. But we do believe this, and this is a quote from Ayn Rand, anyone who fights for the future lives in it today. Thank you for listening to our presentation today. I hope this has been helpful to you. And if you'd like to support our project, please go to christianintellectual.com slash Patreon. You can get access to special things from us from time to time. And you can help us because we need to get this message out to more people. Uh, that is the whole purpose of this, to be preaching the moral life. Thank you, Jacob. Did you have any closing thought? No, that was perfect. Thank you. And uh, thank everybody for joining in. Please find us on Facebook, Twitter, and christianintellectual.com.